So welcome everybody to the 2022 Statistical Science Lecture. I, I would like to um, acknowledge, uh, give an acknowledgement of country. Um, the, we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people whose lands we are meeting on today. Uh, we pay respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be participating in this meeting. For those present, which is you and me, in person at UOW, we acknowledge the Diwali people whose lands we are meeting on. So let me uh, just give you a, a brief background to the statistical science lecture. Um, the very first one was in 2018. And um, since then, we've done it annually. It's um, due to a philanthropic donation uh, to the School of Mathematics and Applied Statistics. Um, and it is to recognize statistical science. It showcases the interdisciplinarity and key role a statistical scientist plays in extracting scientific knowledge from data in the presence of uncertainty. And I want to acknowledge our head of school, Maureen Edwards, who is here representing the school. Um, now, um, we're very privileged to have Mike Jordan um, giving a, the 2022 Statistical Science Lecture. Mike is in great demand. Uh, he's somebody who uh, I'll give a little bit of a background on, but he is certainly uh, an extremely distinguished um, lecturer, and we're very happy to have him. So Michael I. Jordan is the Ping Hong Chen Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he was a professor at MIT from 1988 to 1998 um, until he joined UC Berkeley. His research interests bridge the computational, statistical, cognitive, biological, and social sciences. Professor Jordan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the US National Academy of Sciences, the, National, the US National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and importantly, a foreign member of the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. He's won many, many prizes. Um, and I, I, we need to get on with his lecture, so I'm not going to list them all, Mike. I'm, I apologize for that, but um, it's, it's every year it seems like there's another prize which Mike has uh, very deservedly been awarded. The title of his lecture today is on learning aware mechanism design. So it's over to you, Mike. Thank you. And we'll take questions, by the way, um, around uh, 5 to 12, 12 or something like that. And then we'll finish up at 12.15, um, just to give you some idea. And I want to invite everybody here to stay for our light lunch and drinks and gathering and chats. And we'll discuss a bit more what Mike has presented. So thanks, Mike. Uh, looking forward to your talk. All right. Thank you, Noel. I appreciate being invited. And I'd love to visit in person at some point. Uh, hopefully it's um, so let me take a little bit of a moment here to do the sharing of the traditional sharing of slides. Um, okay, that was looking good. I'm going to do that, and then one more thing, and I should be ready to go. Okay, um, so let me just jump in. Uh, I am a statistician, um, and I'm a statistician who likes to work on large scale emerging real world problems. And as I've been doing that over the years, it's become clear what's missing. Um, why do we sometimes run into real troubles when we're out there in the real world? And it has to do with missing incentives to missing economics uh, perspective on our work. Um, so I'm gonna go through that. Mechanism design is a part of economics. Um, I should say this is not a, what is, I wouldn't call this an entirely new perspective. Um, you know, in the 1950s, people like David Blackwell were doing economics work at the same time as they were doing statistics work and, and computer science for that matter. And I'm sort of picking up on, um, on their perspective. Um, and so in fact, I'd like to start with this slide, which just sort of 
as an academic person for getting in the real world, just uh, what do we have inside of academics? We, uh, I think for in inferential and decision-making problems, there are three foundational disciplines, um, you know, statistics or inference, broadly speaking, economics or incentives um, and computer science computation. And there've been pairwise interactions among these disciplines to solve real world problems. So econometrics is roughly um, the pairwise interaction of statistics and economics. Um, you know, machine learning is, is uh, the pairwise interaction of statistics with computer science. And there's a field that blends economics and computer science that's called algorithmic game theory. Uh, so these all emerged over you know, the decades. Um, and and the, the, what's kind of missing though from the diagram is that um, each of these pairwise interactions doesn't have a lot of role for the third leg of the, of the simplex. So machine learning has not had a lot of economics and a lot of you know, mechanism design or, or incentives. Um, algorithmic game theory has had precious little statistics. Um, and econometrics is argued about really measuring the economy and maybe doing causal inference and not a lot of concern with uh, you know, large scale problems and algorithms, um, combinatorial things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about machine learning with that as, as a background. We'll return to that diagram later in the talk. Uh, so machine learning, first of all, I think of it as just statistics meets computer science. It's really conceptually mostly statistics, um, inference, decision, decision making, and uncertainty. Um, but it's become a commodity, and it's become way larger scale than as a statistician one would have ever imagined. Um, and it's not just data analysis; it's kind of you know playing a role in terms of autonomous systems in our in our lives. The current era has been mostly focused on what's been called historically pattern recognition. Um, uh, so, you know, platforms have made that into a commodity. You could have, you know, billions and billions and billions of data points and uh, and billions of parameters, and you can train that on tens of thousands of computers. Um, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, that didn't seem possible, but it, it's become possible. So lots of companies, lots of entities, lots of science people have uh, have used this commodity. Um, so, uh, you know, with all the success stories that are reported or you know, envisaged, at least, you might think that we're kind of, you know, done. This is a new engineering field based on pattern recognition that's emerged. And I think that is uh, not true. Um, it's it's uh, pattern recognition without decision making um, is not a real engineering field. Um, and so I'm going to talk about decision making here. And we're going to talk a little bit about high stakes decisions and uh, multiple decisions and particularly when we start talking about decisions in the real world, we have to talk about other decision makers uh, interacting with us, with uh, our decisions. And we start to eventually have to talk about scarcity and, uh, and, and market mechanisms. So that's where I want to get to. Um, okay, so decisions. Uh, you know, we have decision theory, you know, is, is that all there is to it? Um, you know, and, and the pattern recognition people uh, make very good predictions now with their systems and if you threshold those predictions are, are you not kind of already making good decisions so let's just um for concreteness to consider a real life situation that you know many of us are used to you go into a doctor's office and you sit down and you discuss data and you discuss treatments um, so let's imagine that in three or four years that um you know the doctor has as in his or her possession, a very large scale neural network or deep learning system that's been trained on all the world's medical data to make really, really good predictions. Um, you know, so uh, it's a little bit of science fiction, but let's imagine this has happened. Um, so you, they put the data for you into this big predictive system. Um, you know, they measure 10,000 or 100,000 variables about you, including your genome, and they put it in this big system and it makes some predictions about you. So let's suppose that one of the predictions is about your heart. And if uh, the, the, that number, that uh, response variable is over 0.7, uh, based on the historical data, it suggests you're about to have a heart attack and you better do something. Um, all right, so it's the, it's the world's best prediction, better than any doctor could make. It has all the world's medical data in it. You know, is, is that really uh, a decision? Is it um, in, a, in, a, in any kind of meaningful sense? And I'd argue no. Um, that when, as soon as you see that result, you're, you're going to start a dialogue uh, towards a decision. You're going to ask the doctor some questions. You're going to say, um, you know, first of all, what's the uncertainty in that, in that you know, my, my number might be 0 0.701 and I'm just over the threshold. So what's the uncertainty? And uncertainty just doesn't, it doesn't just mean a little Gaussian error bar or, you know, um, a bootstrap. It, it really has to do with, you um, all the uncertainty that went into that prediction. So what data was used? Is it recent data or was it 10 years old? 
as we start to build more and more systems that last uh, in the in the world for years, that's going to happen a lot. Um, did they use a machine to, that's similar to the one that was used for me um, to do the measurements? Was the was the uh, cohort of people uh, tested in for that data set similar to me or different in important ways? So on and so forth. Um, and now you're doing you know, almost causal inference in some ways. You're, you're also doing counterfactuals. You're saying, what if I were to eat better? What if I were to exercise more? You'll also remember things you never remembered, you, you had forgotten. So, you know, oh, I, I now I remember I had asthma as a child. Maybe that's relevant. Or my parents had uh, heart disease uh, and I'd forgotten about that. And, and so you, now you realize that that's not even, that's not inside of the big neural net. It didn't have that in its training data. And, and that's going to always be true that in the moment of a decision, when you condition on some outcome, um, things will become relevant that didn't seem relevant before. And that happens all the time, almost every meaningful decision. Um, so building a perfect predictive engine based on historical data is not possible. It's not meaningful in, in decision making. Uh, decision making is this reasoning act when you uh, start to get measurements. Um, and so there's going to be a dialogue with this doctor. Um, and that's what's missing out of the, the pattern recognition perspective, that dialogue. Um, and now, it's not just one decision. I'm making many decisions today about my life and my future and or, you know how I get to the airport and so on. And they all start to interact. And, and that starts to become more like planning. Um, and it becomes networked because my plans interact with other people's plans. Um, and when you think about not just what we do in our lives, but you think about the uh, overall kind of economic systems that we're embedded in, you know, transportation systems, healthcare systems, pandemic response systems, um, financial systems and all. They, they involve human decision-making, but they involve lots of computing systems. Um, and it's that level of, of analysis that we should be thinking about. We shouldn't be thinking about the individuals as much and just the data analysis. Uh, we should be thinking about what does the overall system do? And is it effective? Is it safe? Is it uh, working? Um, Okay, so these are thoughts that I think are not that familiar in statistics. I was trained more to think that I, our goal is to help scientists discover the truth about the world. But more and more, we're doing these things in the real world where we're, we're looking at, you know, small contextual situations, personalized medicine. Um, and we're not just being asked to analyze data, we're being asked to, to, to pr propose uh, in treatments and, um, and be in the loop. Um, and so we got to sort of think a little bit more like this, like an engineer who is building systems that will work effectively in real time in the, in the real world. Okay, so another uh, way to help think about this a little bit is to think about recommendation systems. These are pattern recognition systems. They're, they're, they're a big matrix that's being, um, you know, low rank uh, fit to a matrix. Uh, so, you, you know, you all have the experience, you, you buy a few things from, uh, you know, uh, Amazon or some other uh, store online. Uh, they learn about you a little bit, and now they make recommendations of other products. Um, and so it has found patterns in huge, massive databases, you know, billions, uh, matrices that are billion by billion kind of rows and columns. Um, now, so these are making very good predictions, and they're good enough that they can display them to you, and you probably make more purchases that you made before. And in fact, this has helped commerce a great deal to build systems like this. Uh, so are they kind of, you know, uh, enough for building real world systems. And so you think about, well, let's use recommendations for other things than just commerce, than you know, selling books or, or movies. Um, and you start to realize there's going to be problems, and there have been. Um, so if you recommend the same movie to, um, if, if you recommend movies, uh, and your system is starting to be used by, you know, tens of millions of people, you could recommend the same movie to a million people. And and that's not a problem because there's no scarcity in the world of the bits uh, on the computer. You can copy them as much as you want. And recommending books and things like that, same kind of thing. You can copy them quickly and get them out to your customers. Uh, but if you start recommending things like restaurants to people, um, there is scarcity. You can't recommend the same restaurant to everyone because you'll create congestion. Um, and in some sense, that's kind of obvious. Why would you recommend the same restaurant to everyone? But well, if you're running one of these commodity systems, that's working on tens of millions of people, um, you're, there's no control that you don't recommend the same thing to everybody. Just like books and movies, you'll recommend the same restaurant to many people. Um, and, and, and what if you recommend streets to drivers? You're telling, you know, you're recommending what's the fastest route to the airport. And, um, you know, if you do that for a small number of people, no problem. But if you do it for tens of millions of people, you're going to create congestion. And that's happened. Um, and so you might think these are the kind of trivialities. Well, all I got to do is just not do that. I just don't don't recommend a thousand people to the same restaurant. 
Um, but what, how are you going to do that? Are, are you going to take the first 10 and give them the seats? Are you going to, you know, on what basis are you going to decide who gets to go fastest and so on? And, and these are the kind of things that economists think about. And they, they will tell you, you know, you don't do just arbitrary thresholding. You, you start to assess people's patients. You start to see the utilities. How do I need to get to the hospital really quickly? So I should be given, you know, somehow the faster route. Um, when I'm thinking about the restaurant situation, if I go to um, Sydney for the first time and I'm walking around and I don't know the landscape and I don't know the restaurants, uh, I'd like to be feeling like I'm kind of in a market that I, I announce my availability maybe by my cell phone. Here I am and, and maybe a little about a facts about me that I like Sichuan cuisine or I have a certain price point and here's my location. I don't have any idea at that point what I most want and no one knows. But I, if I feel like I'm you know, learning, I, I, you know, maybe my availability is broadcast to the other side of the market, which are the restaurants. And they look at me and they look at maybe tens of thousands of other people who are wanting to go to the restaurant and they make their own decisions. We'd like to, you know, we prefer foreigners, you know, or we prefer non or people who've come to the restaurant before, whatever. They have their own policy and it starts to interact. And I, and I eventually get a bid on my phone that here's some restaurant that wants me. It's a very different experience than going and searching a website, you know, for best restaurant in Sydney or something. Um and so, you know, if you think about this, uh, really, uh, the right way to think about a lot of these recommendation systems is more like a market. What you're creating is a two-sided market or many-sided. There are consumers and producers on both sides. And um, different from classical microeconomics, um, you don't know the preferences a priori. Um, I don't have any idea what my preferences are for the restaurants in Sydney, or I have the same very rough idea, but I can't rank them. And this is very different from things like, you know, college admissions, where the classical, you know, economics ideas were developed. Uh, you know, college admissions, people sit down and they write down uh, which colleges I prefer and in what order. And the colleges have a very clear criteria, and that forms a two-sided market. A matching algorithm is run, and it, you know, maximizes social welfare or whatever. Um, very important. You know, kidney exchanges work in that way. And, and but, you know, in lots of these emerging situations with, with statistical issues coming to play, we don't know things a priori. We don't know our preferences. We don't know um, aspects of the policy. Uh, so you would like to think that I could, you know, gather data as I do the matching. And the matching and the data now will both improve together jointly. And that'll lead to maybe better traffic routing and better, you know, filling restaurants in a more, uh, you know, happy way. Um, all right, so this is the thing that I see emerging, and in fact, you know, it's not really present. There's there's very few companies and who offer this. They offer platforms mainly where you get a service, but they don't offer this 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 connection. And I want so I want to highlight a domain where I where I've actually been involved um, in trying to change this, uh, which is music, and where it's a very clear, very stark picture, really. Um, so in the music world, there's more music being made than ever before in history right now, and more being listened to than ever by history. That's kind of seems obvious. What's interesting is that most of the music being listened to in any given day around the world is music made in the last six months, and it's music made by someone you never heard of. Um, and so if you look at the data. And so this is, seems surprising. Isn't everyone listening to the Beatles or to Beyonce or whatever? Answer is no. Um, and so you might think this is fantastic. Uh, we have this thriving market where people are making a living and you know they're making music and people are listening to it and it's all great. And, and of course, that's just not true at all. So there's still a legacy rec record companies having a few people like Beyonce, they, they make huge amounts of money. And uh, these other young people who make the, these, the music that everyone's actually listening to, put it up on SoundCloud, it gets streamed by Spotify and other services. And then Spotify figures out ways to make money off of it by you know, subscriptions or, or advertising. Um, and so uh, that's broken. That's that's a missing human happiness. The people that made the music aren't actually having a living. They're not having a job. And um, uh, you know that's um, that needs to be changed. So anyway, this this fellow down in the right hand uh, corner, uh, the bottom right corner there, is, is a colleague and friend of mine, Steve Stout. Uh, he's a legendary person in the hip hop world and um, and music in the United States. Knows lots of people. Uh, he created a company called United Masters, um, and I'm a scientific advisor here on the board. Uh, and um, Steve and I got together and kind of both had this vision of a statistical two sided market. And music is a great example of this. So just the first step is to have a dashboard for musicians. At the end of the week, they come in and they see a map of Australia and they see um, 
uh, oh my goodness, I, I didn't have any idea about this, but I'm I'm pop popular in Melbourne. And, um, you know, 10,000 people listened to my songs last week there. And so the, uh, you ping the people in Melbourne and say, look, I'm popular there. And I even know who's listening to my songs. You could advertise to them. Um, and so can I come give a show? And they, they would say, yes, you would come give a show. You'd make, you know, um, you know, $20,000. Um, and if you do that three times during the year, you have a salary. So that's happened now with United Masters in the United States. Moreover, the company, Steve, reached out to the National Basketball Association and signed a contract with them where the music you listen to behind week's basketball clips is actually music now coming from these United Masters artists. And so every time someone watches a clip, one of these artists is actually getting paid. Um, so it really is a thriving market and it's really going places. It's got over 2 million musicians now signed on for it uh, who didn't sign on to record companies. Um, so I think statisticians can do things like this. Um, and it doesn't have just to be music. It can be uh, other kinds of, of goods, um, intellectual goods. It could be journalism. It could be art. It could be uh, information flow. Okay, so that's kind of the setup of the rest of my talk. Um, so uh, you know, those are the real world phenomena that I'm kind of inspired by and getting at. Uh, what do I do as an academic? Uh, well, there's lots of problems to be solved. And, and so a lot of them have to be um, have to do with optima equilibrium dynamics um, and statistics and machine learning. We're very used to optima, you know, M estimators and optim optimal least squares and so on. We're used to algorithms that can do this in high dimensions, find optima. Um, but in uh, markets and in, you know, these economies that you don't find optima, uh, that would be you know, too, too much to ask for. You find equilibria and you, you want to make sure they're good equilibria. And then you worry about the dynamics of how do you arrive at the equilibria and how do you stay close to an equilibrium, even if it starts to move because the world is changing. Um, and so there's lots of mathematics there having to do with fixed point equations and uh, stochastic extra gradient methods and all that, all the kind of things that were done for uh, classical optimization to move it into this large scale world uh, is kind of re being redone now for equilibria uh, finding and fixed point dynamics. Um, another kind of area we've already alluded to is learning your preferences in the context of a market. Uh, so, um, you know, banded algorithms meet markets. Um, and then recommendation systems being brought into markets where you're learning from people around you in a social network to inform your uh, how a market gets structured. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about, well, I don't think I'll do uncertainty quantification in this particular talk, but that's a whole other area of, of interest. Uh, you really, if you're going to do adversarial and black box kind of methods like we are doing, you need uh, new methods for uncertainty quantification. Things like conformal prediction are turning out to be very useful here. I'll talk about mechanism design and contracts and incentives in the rest of the talk. And just let me say, a lot of people are very interested in fairness, privacy, and social good sort of issues these days, rightly so. And I just want to say that I think of you need to have uh, economic thinking in mind if you approach those problems. You know, fairness is not just a just purely an ethical or a zero one decision. You're fair or you're not. It's kind of how fair and and fair to who and in what way. And same thing with privacy. You know. How much privacy do I lose to engage in some way? What benefit do I get by the loss of privacy? And am I happy with that trade-off and so on? All right, so the goal then would be to have statistics join in with economics and computer science to build these large-scale, fair, learning-based markets that are stabilized over long stretches of time. So that's, a, that's an agenda I think is uh, really uh, present in our, in our field at this point, should be. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of vignettes here of research projects in my group for the last few years to give you a flavor of what kind of research you can do, what kind of results you can get. And um, um, and uh, I won't go into great mathematical detail here. The idea is really to expose you to the problems and the thinking style. All of these are papers on the archive in the last few months, really. very Most of these are very recent. Um, so let's start with strategic classification. Um, this work with my students, uh, Tiana Zernich and Eric Mazumdar at Berkeley. Um, strategic classification, the word strategic is an economics word and classification is a statistics word. So we're putting these two together. And this has to do with problems uh, where there are strategic agents who are supplying data. So an example would be if you fill out a health insurance form, you're supplying data to the health insurance company who's trying to decide how much to charge you for your health insurance. And so they're going to ask questions that have to do with how healthy you are. Uh, but of course, you know they're asking questions having to do with how healthy you are. 
and you'd like to get a good rate. And so you're kind of incentivized to sort of shift your date a little bit, you know, to, to bring your weight down, to bring your, uh, how, how much you drink uh, down and, and so on and so forth. So people do this. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong or illegal or eth ethical or unethical, but this is how humans behave. Um, and in fact, you know, so the health insurance companies know this and they try to ask questions that are hard to, to fake. And so one example is um, a health insurance companies in, uh, in, the, in Europe were asking people to opt into their cell phone for a day. Hart's law is where you have some measure, like in this case, a poverty index score that in 1994 looked very nice in Gaussian. And by 2003, people had realized what was going on and they shifted their data so that everyone appeared to be more poor than they really were. And for obvious reasons. All right. So the general problem is there's going to be feedback loops in collecting data and analyzing data when, when you have people supplying the data. Um, so, you know, so people are supplying data, let's call it strategic data. And the decision maker is taking in that data and building a predictive model. And the agents are learning about the predictive model. I mean, maybe for regulatory reasons, the insurance company or the bank has got to sort of say what kind of model they're using and, and, or but people might just kind of figure it out. And um, so over iterations of this, they'll move their data a little bit to get the outcome they prefer. So, um, and, and the bank is aware of this, so they should in some sense de-bias their model fitting and um, you know, they will. Um, and so now the question is kind of what happens in this system? And this is a game, it's an iterated game and it has gonna have maybe hopefully equilibria and hopefully favorable equilibria. We, we have to analyze that. We can't just assume the data are unbiased or, you know, or, or in some simple bootstrap way, make the bias go away. So the question is, what is the equilibrium solution in now this statistical game? It's the new kind of game. Game theorists have not studied this kind of game. Uh, they have studied Stackelberg games, and this is the general game here is a Stackelberg game where you go back and forth. It's a sequential game. Nash games are simultaneous. This is sequential. Uh, but it's a Stackelberg game of a special kind where you build the best response in one direction is to build a model. The best response in the other direction is to supply strategic data. And in these games, in Stackelberg games, uh, it's really important who's the leader and who's the follower. You get different dynamics and different social welfare depending on who's the leader and who's the follower. And it's not always clear, is it better to be a leader or a follower? Like in game theory in general, it's, it's not necessarily clear. It might be one or the other. All right, so if you start to analyze this, the, the first start, uh, the place that people have started, there has been a little bit of work on this, is to analyze it as a Stackelberg game, but where it's synchronized. So you may, you do it one, you know, you do it stepwise, you build a model, you supply data, you build a model. Um, and of course, in the real world, that's not how synchronized people will just supply data whatever whenever they want to, and the system will update however fast it wants to. So you really want to start thinking about situations where there are decoupled timescales. We're starting to build distributed systems. And so one can either decide to go quickly or more gradually, depending on the situation. All right. So one particular version of this is where this decision maker is slow relative to the agents. Okay, when would this ever happen in real life? Well, this happens all the time. For example, college admissions. Um, the college is not going to update its criteria after every applicant. They will wait every couple of years, maybe, to update their criteria, their model of who gets admitted or not, um, and for obvious social reasons. On the other hand, the other direction is very common, too. When would the decision maker go very, very fast? Well, that happens all the time in online platforms, like YouTube will update its, um, its model uh, of users after each user. They do it constantly, fast. OK, so now if you analyze this, um, it, it, it turns out that these systems have equilibria and you get different equilibria depending on who's the leader true for uh, statistical games of the country. Everybody gets higher welfare. So I'm going to stop move on to a second vignette. Uh, this is with Lydia Liu, meet matching markets. So I've already alluded to this. Uh, bandits are statistical methods for finding an, a, a, a uh, for, for choosing among a set of options, finding the one that you prefer. Um, so here's just to remind you of what a multi-arm bandit is. I have a decision maker who's got several options um, and they don't know which is best. So this could be, you know, model fitting. They're just trying to decide which model to use. So they try one and they get a reward. And they're, so there's some underlying distribution. Uh, they don't know the distribution, but they're getting samples from it. And they maybe then try the second arm and they get a reward, the arm that has got the highest, say, mean reward. 
Now, if you do this in a uh, naive way and you wait too long to get that estimate, then you've lost a lot of, of possible reward along the way. And so that's called regret in the bandit literature. Uh, you don't want to have regret. You want to find an arm quickly relative to an oracle that knew the best arm a priori. Okay. Okay. So I was describing about multi arm bandit problems. And, it, and if you know about this literature at all, you'll know there's something called the upper confidence bound algorithm. It, it forms confidence bounds on or confidence intervals for the mean rewards. And it picks the arm that has got the highest upper confidence bound. So that encourages both you to pick arms that are good. Uh, but also, if you haven't explored very much, if you have a very wide confidence interval, you'll pick that one to get more information and try to get a better idea of what the mean is. Algorithmic with respect to the, the oracle that knows the best arm up. So that's on the statistics side. On the, on the economic side, matching markets, uh, you write down your preferences a priori. Uh, you have buyers and sellers. The buyers have preferences over the sellers and vice versa. And then there's a famous algorithm uh, you know, called deferred acceptance that runs and matches buyers to sellers so that everybody is, roughly speaking, as happy as they can be. Um, all right, and so we wanna obviously build something that puts these two ideas together. Um, so now imagine you don't just have one agent who's uh, running the bandit algorithm, you have multiple agents, say two. And suppose that they, at some point, both pick the same arm. All right, so what happens here? Well, we want competition, we want uh, scarcity. So we assume that one of the agents gets the reward, and the other agent gets no reward. So who gets the reward? Uh, well, in this case, the bear got it because maybe arm two prefers the bear. So the human looks at that and says, oh, I see, I like arm two, but um, when I pick it, the bear seems to like it too. And when the bear picks it, uh, the bear wins. So I better pick some other arms that I'm, you know, to, to hedge my bets. So that suggests you're gonna have mo more regret in the bandit problem because of the presence of competition. And so uh, this seems like a theorem. Can we prove that? And how much regret loss do you have by the presence of other agents in the uh, in a, in now what we call a bandit market? And um, so we are able to analyze that. We define a notion of regret. So I'm going a little fast here, just because I don't want to get into details. I know what you're, again the paper will provide all the details. Uh, but regret here is measured relative not to the uh, it's re measured relative to a, um, 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 the best matching a priori. So if you knew the mean rewards and you ran the classical algorithm in microeconomics, you would do a matching and we want to have good regret relative to that. Okay, so this is called, we call this the stable regret. All right, and um, here's a particular algorithm we've analyzed. We call it Gale Shapley upper confidence bound. And basically it runs the upper confidence bound algorithm um, and it sends the upper confidence bounds to this Gale Shapley deferred acceptance algorithm to do the matching. So it's a blend of the two algorithms. And then finally, we analyze it and we show that it has logarithmic regret still. So we didn't actually lose in terms of the regret, the rate. Uh, where, you, where there's a loss is there's a denominator term now, which has a, um, a gap between agents. So if two agents are close, they both like arm two, then the reward gap is small. And so that contributes a constant to the denominator and makes the, 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 the regret higher. Um, now, but it's just a constant. It's still logarithmic, which is optimal in this problem. Uh, so competition uh, affects not the rate, but it affects the constant. Um, okay, so again, this is becoming a bit of a little field. There's lots of work on this. And we have a recent paper, which takes it, I think, uh, a significant step further. This is with various colleagues at Berkeley. Um, and we're sort of trying to do this now in, in generality. Uh, that was a particular setup, but now we're doing this in some generality. Matching markets meet bandits in some generality. And what do I mean by generality? Well, we're going to introduce transferable utilities. So for economists, this is very important. Um, matching markets of the kind I just showed don't have any money. You don't pay anybody when you set up the market. Um, that's very different from something like you know ride sharing. When uh, when I match when Uber matches a driver to a rider. Um, there's a payment being made, there's a price being set, and that leads to much more effective markets in principle, although Uber is not particularly effective uh, in principle, than just classical uh, money-free matching markets that, like the college example. Uh, so we want to introduce these transfer utilities, and now we have statistics problems where there's also prices. We really are bringing statistics together with um, economics. Um, Okay, so now to really bring statistics to economics, you need to have some kind of criterion function, like you know a likelihood, or you know like a 
like a loss. And, and the, the economics frameworks um, don't typically have that. They have stability, which roughly means that the market is either stable or it's not. Um, and so what we needed to do is develop a quantitative notion of instability. How far away from stability are you? Um, so this is like a loss function. How far from an optimum are you? We're trying to say how far from equilibrium are you? Um, and so once we have that measure of instability, you can go downhill in it. You can optimize for it and try to get more stable and get a better equilibrium. Okay, so um, here's an equation that has this new measure of instability in it. Uh, again, I'm not gonna get into mathematical details here, but just to sort of roughly say, um, inside the brackets there, you have a comparison between uh, the utilities of all the agents, that's use of A, um, and the utilities plus the transfers, the mon monetary transfers, that's the tau sub A. Um, and then you take a maximum over all subsets of agents. And so this has a bit of a feel of Shapley value or the VCG mechanism, if you know what that is from economics. Um, but the right way to interpret, or the best way to interpret this is actually to take the dual of this problem. And the dual has a very nice economic interpretation. Uh, it's how much you have to subsidize agents to achieve stability. Okay, so if you have a system that's currently not stable, if you put more money into it, uh, more transfer, you will move towards stability. Um, and so how much money do you have to put in it to get much, uh, to get stability? That's a measure of instability. Okay. So this now becomes a criterion function, a Lyapunov function, if you will, that you can optimize with respect to say statistical parameters with respect to data. Um, and it turns out when you, so that, you know, this is the, the full picture that you have this a new measure and there's a primal dual formulation and all. And if you now return, for example, to the, the matching market problem we had earlier with uh, you know, multi-armed bandits, uh, that logarithmic regret that we proved there by brute force, it falls out from this Lyapunov function. Okay, so it encompasses that previous analysis in a, in a more elegant general framework. Okay, so my last little vignette um, before finishing is this, this uh, new topic that we were calling statistical contract theory. So this is with Stephen Bates, who's a postdoc with me at Berkeley. Michael Sklar is at, um, at Stanford. And Jake Soloff was a student with me. He's moved to Chicago. Um, so contract theory is another area of economics. It's probably less known than some of the other things I've talked about, matching markets or, or auctions. But it's a very important part of economics. It's a situation where you have a principal and you have a bunch of agents. And the principal wants the agents to do something. I'll get into this example of the FDA later, but just for a moment, the principal wants the agents to do something or to provide services or to you know, get something done. And the agents have information that they know about themselves that they're not willing just to share with the principal. So they have some data and they don't wanna share it. So why, how would that happen? Well, imagine you know, when you go on an airplane, you probably have asked yourself at some point, why is there not a single fixed price for the airplane? Why do all the seats kind of different? Why is there business class and economy class? And, you know, it's not uh, that hard to understand why. Um, you know, some people really are happy to pay a lot of money to get on that airplane for whatever reason. And the airplane would like to ask them to pay a lot of money. They'll make, they would like to get that surplus. Um, and other people are not willing to pay a lot of money. They don't have money or they don't really care to be on this flight so much. So they're not going to pay for an expensive ticket. Uh, now, the airplane doesn't know a priori who is willing to pay and who's not. Uh, and if they try to kind of figure out that would be called price discrimination, it's not, it's not legal or fair. Um, all right. So, so instead what they do is they offer some options. They say, here's not just one price, but there's multiple prices. So if you pr pay a little bit more, you'll have this thing called business class where you get a little glass of wine and you get a little bit of a bigger chair and you get to be first in line. And kind of amazingly, there are people who are willing to pay a thousand dollars more for that kind of service. Uh, and they are very happy. They feel very good about themselves. Uh, and then the people in the back are very happy that they're paying way less and they don't care about that glass of wine and they don't care about being first in line and they feel very good about themselves that they saved a lot of money. So everybody's happy. And moreover, the airplane is happy because they filled the plane and they did it with prices that are sort of more or less tuned. All right, so this is a important part of economics. What you're doing is you're giving people the option of letting them select based on their hidden knowledge that you don't have to uh, access. You don't have to ask them because they wouldn't tell you anyway. And it might not be illegal or fair or you know, you're maybe a privacy violation. So you don't do that. You provide a menu of options and then they are able to select from that. 
Okay, so that's contract theory. We're doing statistical contract theory. And um, so here's an example of why we, we wanted to bring statistics into this problem. Classical contract theory had really no role for statistics. So imagine the principle is the Federal Drug Administration. That's in the US. I don't know what it is in Australia, but there's an agency in the government who's trying to decide what drugs go to market. Okay. And so they're going to run clinical trials at a cost, you know, a vast cost, uh, tens of millions of dollars in the US every year for clinical trials for things like vaccines. And that'll they'll run on thousands of people, so it costs a lot of money, but they'll get pretty good false positive and false negative control out of their clinical trial. Um, now, great, but where do the where do the um, who are the agents here? Uh, well, the agents are the drug companies who are supplying candidate drugs to the to the to the principal who is evaluating the drugs. Now, the agent actually knows a little bit probably about it, whether it's a good drug or not. Um, they maybe, you know, did a little internal testing or they know, you know, who, what, did they put really good scientists on that problem or not? Um, but if the principal asked them, is this a good drug before, when they submit it, the, the, obviously the agent's not going to say, not going to tell them. They're not incentivized to tell them. They, they are hoping to just throw the candidate drug at the FDA and it, they run a clinical trial and there's a false positive. And even if their drug's not any good, uh, it's approved and they make some money for a few years until people kind of catch on and a new drug comes out. Uh, so that's the current setting in many of these regulatory markets. Uh, statistics is not being used in an effective way. And so are they doing statistics at all? Well, of course they are. They're doing name and Pearson testing. Uh, so here's a little table. You know, if the drug is a bad drug, theta is equal to zero. Bad just maybe means it's not effective. It doesn't do anything. Um, the probability of approval can be, you know, is set to 0.05, you know, false positive rate. Uh, if the if the drug is a good one, um, you know you can design a test such that um, the probability of approval is uh, you know eighty percent. Um, you know that's the that's the power. So is this a good statistical protocol? Well, you know, Naaman Pearson tells us it's optimal. Um, uh, you know, but it's not a good statistical. It's not a good protocol for this problem. So imagine two cases. Case one: there's a small profit to be made. It cost you twenty million to run the trial. And if you're approved, you'll make 200 million. So this is kind of small drug, small market. Now you can do a calculation, you being the, the company and also the, 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 the regulatory agency can do this little calculation. Uh, conditioning on theta equals zero, that the drug is not actually any good, uh, the expected profit is minus 10 million, okay? And now if that's true, the uh, drug company's gonna look at that and they're gonna say, uh, we should not send our drug to the FDA um, unless we're really convinced it's a good drug because um, they'll lose money. And the FDA is now pretty happy because even if they don't know whether they're getting a good drug or not, um, you know, they, they know the incentive structure is that they're mostly going to get good candidate drugs. All right, but the same, now let's think about the same statistical test in a different case uh, where there's a large profit to be made. You, it costs you $20 million to run the trial. But if you're approved, you get $2 billion. So this is, you know, like headache medicine or something. Um, so now if you do the same calculation, the expected profit, given the drug is not any good, is $80 million. And so now the company is very incentivized to send lots and lots of drugs to the FDA, hoping for some false positives where they can get their drugs through and they'll make some money, even though it's not really helping anybody. All right. So, um, you know, we're, we're, for some clinical trials, we're maybe on more like case one. Others, we're on case two. We don't really know. Okay, so this is now uh, the design. Uh, this is a now becomes a good statistical problem. It's name and Pearson in the setting of contract theory. Okay, so uh, again, I'm not going to provide details here, um, and I'm going to finish up in five minutes. So um, just to say briefly, the idea is that we set up a statistical contract, and it's an opt-in protocol. The agent is, uh, is allowed to opt-in or just decide to walk away. If they opt-in, they have to pay an amount R, uh, you know, reservation price. Uh, and then they're going to choose a payout function from a menu of options. This is a contract. So it's not just one payout function. They choose one from a menu of functions. Um, and then a statistical trial is run that yields a random outcome. Uh, we call that Z. It's sampled from the true P theta, even though no one knows theta, but the, the outcome is sampled from the truth. Um, and now the agent receives the payoff that they had, uh, they had selected, f of z, and the principal uh, receives a utility which depends on f of z and also depends on the true theta. Because if the FDA is approving lots of bad drugs, then uh, their utility is going to be low. Over time, people are going to realize they're doing a bad job. 
Okay, so that is our statistical contract setting. And now there's lots of mathematics questions to ask, statistics and economics questions. Uh, for example, what kind of contracts are good? Uh, are, is, what are the incentives in this contract? And so just briefly, first thing you have to do as an economist-oriented person is define incentive alignment. And so we've done that. Um, we say a menu is incentive aligned um, if essentially the expected profit uh, under the null, uh, meaning the drug is no good, is, is, is negative, uh, less than or equal to zero. So then it's an incentive aligned contract. Okay, makes sense. And here's the cool, interesting result, which is that we have now a theorem, which says that a contract is incentive aligned if and only if, so we have a characterization, all payoff functions, the entire contract uh, are E values. Uh, so you, you may have heard of E values. They're um, an alternative to P values. Uh, P values are tail probabilities under the null. E values are, um, random variables whose expectation is less than or equal to one under the null, um, and more generally non-negative martingales. Okay, so E-values have been proposed um, by various people, Vladimir Falk and others, uh, as kind of replacements for P-values, if you will. And what we've discovered in this line of research is that E-values are in one-to-one -one correspondence with, uh, with incentive-aligned contracts, okay, in this new contract theory uh, situation. All right, so that gives us recipes for designing contracts, and we now we're starting to do this for various kinds of problems. And let me just—I don't—I I thought I had a slide here. There's an area called federated learning in machine learning, uh, which is this very large-scale learning problems where you have lots of agents, people like on their cell phones, supplying data to a principal who's collecting the data to do some large-scale data analysis. Uh, and um, in real life, you have to start asking questions about why would people do this? Are they incentivized to supply their data? What loss did they have from privacy reasons? What gain do they have? Uh, and so you really need something like contract theory to be to make this really, really go somewhere and be viable. And uh, so in that domain, it maps very nicely onto our setup here, and we're able to design statistical contracts for federated learning, and we have a paper on that. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. Um, um, as I alluded to earlier on, I think that there are three foundational disciplines in, in this activity that we're talking about here of designing uh, you know, these, these emerging systems that people are really using in real life. And um, um, the, the, the main point of this is that, uh, yes, it already kind of exists in these, these pairwise blends, but most of the problems I talked about today had all three together. There was some statistics, there was some economics, and there was some computer science. And so uh, it's pretty rare to actually see all three coming together in academics. In industry, it's not that rare. You definitely see uh, solutions that involve all three. Uh, and my last comment then is that what is this thing called machine learning? You know, statisticians have kind of debated it for a while. They, you know, it seems like it's just statistics, um, but it, it seems like it hadn't gone away and it's kind of only gotten bigger and all that. And so, you know, what is it? Is it something different from statistics? And and so what I hear here, I think I finally kind of realized what it is. Um, it, it's, it's emergence of a new engineering field. So most sciences and mathematical fields, uh, as they got mature, they spawned off an engineering field. So chemical engineering, those products, uh, that, was, that was new. That was complicated. And it didn't necessarily work very well. Um, a lot of factories didn't quite work. Uh, and a field emerged to make them work. It's called chemical engineering. It has its own principles and its own mathematics and so on. Same thing with electrical engineering. Um, and so I think that's what's happening now is that we have statistics, we have computer science, we have economics. They are the principles. They're like being in the laboratory. What, what, you know, if you do things at a small scale, here's how you do it. And the question is, if you put them at large scale and really roll them out to serve lots of people in, in, in the real world, uh, can you actually have principles that'll ensure you that it'll really work out there, that'll handle the long tail, it'll be fair, it'll be robust, it'll work over long stretches of time and so on. And I personally think we're pretty far from that. Just like maybe in 1940, the chemical engineers felt they were pretty far. They didn't have design plans for, for chemical plants. I think we're pretty far from being able to say, here's how you develop a social commerce network system that actually delivers value to people and doesn't have all kinds of problems. Um, but, uh, you know, as a statistician, I think this, I want to embrace this. You know, again, I was taught as a statistician, we're there just to serve the scientists and discover truth. And I don't think that's entirely true. I think we're also there to be in the real world and help build systems that bring value to human beings and are safe and useful. And, and, and so there's an engineering side that the statistics never really embraced. But I think if we're now mature enough, 
just like the chemists were mature enough or the physicists were mature enough to lead to, to support an engineering field. I think that's actually what's happening. That's the phenomenon of machine learning. All right, so I'm going to finish there and I'd be happy to take questions.